Hey friends, welcome back. Today is a very exciting day because we're finally gonna be covering security best practices of Node.js. Yes, you heard me right. And it's going to be a series of videos where we're going to dive deep into some topics that may be obvious or non-obvious or even super advanced for you. So buckle up and let's get started. What I like about this topic is that it's basically applicable to other languages and frameworks as well, if you're developing web applications. With that said, let's start with the very first point that we have. Today we're going to have seven points, and in the following videos we're going to cover even more, even detailed points. So let's start with the first one, rate limiting. What is it and why do we even need it? Well, there's a thing called DOS attacks, or to be concrete, DDoS attacks nowadays. What it stands for is distributed denial of service attack. This is when a hacker acts as a client and sends a bunch of requests to our server in order to bring it down. A bunch meaning thousands or even tens of thousands requests simultaneously so that our server is busy and is not able to process any further requests. Well, how do you basically secure yourself from that? Well, you use a rate limiter and the rate limiter basically defines how many processes or requests a node server is going to accept at a given time, all right? And the very basic way of installing a rate limiter on your Node.js server is by using one of the coolest libraries called Express Rate Limit. Here, it's this is the way you use it, literally one line, and of course you can define how hard your rate limiter should be, but I wouldn't suggest using it in like scaled applications, in bigger applications. It's fine for your pet project. The reason is, Rate limiter doesn't really belong to your node application because your node application is mostly concerned about the business logic, all right? Rate limiter should probably live in an Nginx server. And the way you add it, it's literally one line as well. So it's also very simple. And you might ask, why do I need an Nginx server with my Node.js? Well, the answer is, it's a pretty common practice to have an Nginx server running in front of your Node.js server, all right? This is why people usually put the rate limiter into an Nginx server so that it handles it for you. Now, another point is that if we go one step further, is the are the cloud providers. If you're using one of the cloud providers already, like AWS or Microsoft Azure or whatever, Google Cloud, maybe you should use one of their solutions. For example, AWS already has a built-in request rate limiter that you can simply attach to your API gateway, meaning you don't even need to use it on an Nginx level. All right, okay. Now the second point is password encryption. Let's talk about this. You probably know that if, whenever you're registering a user on your server, on in your app, the user, let's say, puts ABC as a password, just a theoretical password. We wouldn't store this ABC in our database as a plain string like ABC. The reason is, if our database gets compromised, meaning if the hackers get access to our database and they can read all the passwords, they can literally take this password and later log into our system using exactly this password. So whenever you encrypt it, meaning this password ABC is no longer going to be ABC, but some really random hash so that the hacker is not able to figure out the original password. And the way you do it is by using Bicrypt, all right? Bicrypt is one of the biggest packages for Node.js that people are using. Literally every everyone is using everyone that I know. So I would suggest going with this as well. And of course, it's pretty secure. The way it hashes your passwords is first of all, it uses one of the modern hashing algorithms. It also adds a salt to it. Salt is basically a random string that gets hashed together with your password. And it does one round of hashing. Then it does a second, third, fourth, basically a very complicated and obviously the more rounds of hashing you add, the more secure your password is going to be encrypted, but it also takes longer to process it. Okay, let's admit security is a pretty important topic. And what do you usually do with such important topics? Well, of course you document it for the future reference. And one of our sponsors is doing exactly that. It helps you to document with the help of the AI, and this leads to Docuo. Doco is an AI-powered knowledge base platform, which makes it easy to build a self-service knowledge base for your customers and developers. Doco lets you have your documentation in different places, as a private space or in a team project. In my case, I already have my awesome AI project, so I will go into it, but unfortunately, I don't have any documents here and it's completely empty. Well, I don't want to waste time creating all the directories and the outlines, so I will use the AI. And here I can type my target audience, for example, automotive companies, web developers, 
data scientists, software engineers, you can put anything that you th can think of. You can also put your product description so that the AI is aware of it. In my case, it's an AI algorithm for detecting the road lanes. And now you can simply click generate. And now after a few seconds, it already proposed a good setup. I will click apply because it seems quite good to me. And now I have the structure on the left. How cool. I saved a lot of time instead of creating all of this myself, of course. I'm also interested in actually filling out one of these documents. And I want to add some code examples. I mean, I already have code examples in my GitHub, but I first want to create a kind of an outline for actually installing OpenCV and Python and or rather integrating all of them together. So I will create a quick start for developers and I will add more information such as a guide for OpenCV and Python integration. And I will click generate. Two seconds later, I already have my step-by-step -step guide so that I'm not gonna miss anything because it literally covered everything that I needed. Crazy. And now after saving it, we can even publish it as a document on a hosted website. And of course you can choose whatever domain you want. In my case, it's an AI project.spreading.io. Go check it out, link in the description. The next point, JWT blacklisting. You probably already used JWT in your server fontan communication in order to manage the sessions, okay? It's, a very, it's very popular nowadays. But here's the thing, if you're a banking system or some very highly vulnerable system, you probably want to have a way to blacklist your JWT tokens. What does it mean? Well, J JWTs live on the client. Okay, so the server issues the JWT and the, it lives in the browser of the client. There's no way of the server to revoke this JWT. Let's say we have a case where this JWT gets compromised and we get an information about it from some source. And now we want this client to no longer have this JWT. But how can we do that? We can't just do this because we don't have access to the browser of the client. So we can use JWT blacklisting, but it's not that simple. One way of doing this is, let me actually remove all of that. One way of doing this is first of all, saving the session of the JWT in the database. Why? Well, JWTs already have a built-in expiration date, okay? Expiration dates can be short or long-lived, and if it gets uh, compromised, we already know which JWT got compromised and we simply revoke it from our database. And the next time the client sends the JWT, we check it against the database. Okay, it's compromised, it's no longer there. We don't process it. You have to register or log in again. Now, this goes against the con concept of JWTs because they are supposed to be stateless. You can't simply save JWTs in the database again, right? Because yeah, that's the whole point of JWTs that they have to be living in the client. Well, there is a different way of dealing with that, which is issuing two tokens, all right? One JWT token and the second one is a refresh token, meaning we will make this JWT very short-lived, literally three minutes, let's say, and we also have another token, a refresh token, meaning we save the refresh token in the database, meaning, okay, we're not copying the JWT, it's a different token. And if the JWT that comes to our server has, has been expired because it's very short-lived, we simply ask the client to send the refresh token as well, or actually the refresh token goes at the same time to the server. We check the refresh token and the, if the refresh token has is, is matching the one that we have in the database, we simply issue the new JWT right away. All right, so that if the JWT is short-lived, we don't force the user to log in every three minutes. Okay, now the next point is JSON schema validation. Why is it important? Well, everything that comes to our server is basically vulnerable. Every user input, every post get request that the client makes to our server has to be verified. And the way you do it is basically having a schema for the request body that's coming from your client. This is basically like a TypeScript for HTTP calls. So you say, I'm expecting these lines, I'm expecting a type string, I'm expecting a zip property, which should be a string, a country, which should be a string, and so on. And you can even make some of them optional. And then as soon as the request has reached the node server, we're going to check against this JSON schema. Okay, that's why it's called JSON schema validate. So definitely use it, it's very important nowadays. The next one is escaping HTML and CSS. Your client might send HTML and CSS code, and of course, it's very important to escape them too. For example, if the client sends an and ampersand yeah, character, this might be a vulnerability because they might do a SQL injection or some other things. That's why it's very hard. It's very important to escape it. And it's, of course, it's very simple. As you can see, it's literally just wrapping it within the uh, method. So definitely keep this in mind. If your library 
that your of the parser like body parser or any library that you're using basically to deconstruct your request body already does that maybe you don't need a library but keep this in mind the next point is orm and odm against injections again this goes hand in hand with kind of escaping but not really because this is more about database communication what is an orm well orm is something like sqlite okay or something like mongoose you probably also heard it basically an extra layer that sits on top of your node server or rather between the node server and these databases. For example, Oracle, Postgres, My MySQL, MariaDB, SQLite, and so on. And Mongoose is, of course, for document-oriented databases like MongoDB. What does it do? Well, it doesn't let you write, well, I mean, of course, it does let you write um, SQL statements or SQL queries, but it's much simpler. For example, if you want to make a post request, you simply do user.create because you already have a user schema and then you supply everything in a JSON notation. Okay, very simple. And of course, if you want to select something from the database, you no longer do select this, this from user table, but rather do this and you're all set. Okay, this is very easy. And of course, it sanitizes your, um, your, your uh, queries that you're doing to the database at the same time. All right, this is very important as well because yeah, user input that can come from the client, get has to be sanitized at this point. All right, the next point is security linter. I actually didn't know about this before preparing for this video, but turns out there's an ASLint plugin that is that seems to be very useful. What does it do? Well, it basically adds these extra rules to your code so that the linter checks your code during while you're writing, writing the code so that you don't write any vulnerable code. All right, these new buffer and so on, um, uh, regex related stuff, CSRF related stuff. So it's very useful. Go check it out as well. I will put all the links in the description. All right, if you found value from this video, don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss the new videos because there's going to be part two and part three and most likely part four that are also very important.